Good afternoon, and thank you for joining the National Center for Rural Road Safety for our second April webinar. My name is Jamie Sullivan. I'm the director of the National Center for Rural Road Safety. Uh, today's webinar is called Instantly Improving Public Speaking for Technical Professionals. We have just a few logistics for you. Our duration today, again, will be only one hour. Um, closed captioning is available, and the link is being shown right now, as well as it was emailed to those of you who requested it. We will be recording this website, webinar, and it will be available on our website uh, for archival within a few days. You can find that under ruralsafetycenter.org. Uh, under our training drop-down under webinar archive, and that's where you can find all of our previous webinars. We are going to be using a couple of the different um, pods in today's webinar, so if you do have any questions, please go ahead and put those in our Q&A pod over on the right-hand side. Um, you'll also notice that in our handout pod, we have several different um, handouts for you to download. Uh, one of those is today's slide deck. There also will be this introductory portion of the slides, which have several resources for you. And then we're going to talk about the MATCH program. And there are two handouts over in that pod for you to download on the MATCH program if you're interested. Additionally, we will have a survey at the end of today's webinar. We would love it if you could fill this out and let us know what kind of topics you'd like to hear from us in future webinars. And then we will be sending certificates of completion within a couple weeks. If the certificate of completion is not enough for your professional licensure and you do need to apply for CEUs, the application to apply for those from Montana State University um, will be provided at that time and you can send that back to Montana State University. We'd also like to thank our co-sponsor for today's webinar, um, the NL TAPA Safety Work Group. And then we'd like to recognize one more time our brand new Road Safety Champion Program inaugural graduates. There are 13 of those. Uh, if you're interested in joining our Road Safety Champion Program or are looking to complete your uh, Road Safety Champion Program and become a graduate, we will be starting those courses up again in August. And so keep an eye out on your email. We will be announcing registration for those uh, later this month. In addition, I wanted to remind everyone that the Safe Streets and Roads for All grant is still open. That notice of funding opportunity, uh, May 16th at 5 p.m. Eastern time is the sole deadline for the implementation grants and the second deadline for the planning and demonstration grants. In addition, uh, August 29th at 5 p.m. Eastern time will be the third and final deadline for the planning and demonstration grants. And you can learn more on their website and then as I did mention, Federal Highway Administration's Local and Tribal Road Safety Program has what's called the MATCH program. It's Mentoring, Assistance, Training, and Communication Help um, is what MATCH stands for. It is a free technical assistance program provided by the Office of Safety uh, through local and tribal road safety peers. And they are looking to facilitate connections between local or tribal jurisdictions that are looking for help and they are currently seeking people who are in, in need of technical assistance. Um, if you are interested in this, in applying to be a part of the MATCH program, we have uploaded those pamphlets into the handouts download. Uh, one of those is a flyer for how you can apply for the MATCH program, and the other one is examples of technical assistance that they have already done uh, through the MATCH program. And then for today, our presenter once again will be Kevin Elliott. Our first webinar this month um, had a great response. We asked Kevin to come back and do a part two. Uh, Kevin is a veteran professional communicator who has worked for nearly nine years in transportation safety communication, in addition to working as the marketing manager for the National Center for Rural Road Safety. His clients include departments of transportation in Florida, Ohio, and South Dakota as well as many safety teams in the Federal Highway Administration. He lives in Panama City, Florida with his wife and 12 chickens, and we are super excited to hand over today's presentation to Kevin. Hello, everybody. Let me get my screen going. All right. You see my home screen, Jamie? Yes, I am. All right, cool. Thanks for coming, everybody. Um, welcome back. If you were at our uh, previous webinar this month, the communication webinar, welcome the first time. If you, this is your first time being on one of these things, I hope it's worth your time. 
I know you have 10,000 webinars you could choose from for this kind of thing and lots of work to do. So we're glad you chose this one. Um, I'm going to always, as always, because you need to see the giant picture of my head again, I'm going to start there. I, I just will confess, I hate not being able to see you. I hate it. Yeah. And you're going to see why in this one, because this is a, a tips on public speaking. And most of these come from speaking in front of live audiences for a very long time. And also these tips will best help you. One of the hardest things is not seeing you. So I like to show you a big giant picture of my head. So at least you know what I look like for better or worse. I do live in Panama City, like Jamie said. Um, just a little, let me sell myself to you a little bit, why you should listen to me on this topic. Um, in addition to the things that Jamie mentioned, I work with technical people every day, but I, I don't consider myself a technical person in the sense of like an engineer or planner designer type. I'm a communicator by training and trade. So my master's degree is in corporate and public communication. I did work for years in marketing firms and advertising. And I say that because it, I think it gave me a little, a little different perspective, uh, sort of outside the agency world. What works, what doesn't work when it comes to communication and that sorts of thing. And I taught public speaking for, for a very long time. I, I uh, have been doing this teaching, or excuse me, speaking in public since I was, 18 years old and I'll be 50 this year. So just doing it a very long time. But I also taught this at the Florida State University for almost a decade. I taught hundreds of public speaking students that came through the program. In that time, I saw a lot as you can imagine, but over time I started to see themes, very common behaviors students would do and also just watching public speaking all over the country and being part, and, and noticing my own mistakes and things that I tend to do. I've boiled this down into a few, few of the most common that are also luckily easily fixable if you'll just change your behavior. So that that's, I wanted to give you my resume a little bit and tell you why and where this came from and why I hope you trust me on this one. If you'll, if you'll do this, I've just seen this happen so many times. It will work if you, if you try it. Last thing I raised, I raised chickens. And I always say that because if I could see you out there, and there are more than 300 of you on this call currently, if I could see you, some of you are out there raising your hand and saying, I raise chickens too. What's your favorite kind, Kevin? I put that out there because it's fun. It's a fun uh, conversation starter, an icebreaker, but also too, because we are a subculture of the chicken people. We're among you. You just don't know it. Um, and if you start to ask around, you'll find out there's this crazy little subgroup out there. So if you raise chickens, and you want to talk about them, follow up with me afterwards. Okay. For the rest of you who are not chicken people, why are you here? I always start with a cheesy stock photo of corporate people because I I, I just love how cheesy they are. And they've all, all those people have been like Photoshopped together. It, it makes me chuckle. But that's going to be us. We're going to be the super professional, smiley, uh, overly positive corporate people when we get all when we get done with this this is why you're here you're going to learn uh fundamentally why are you scared to speak in public why am i scared to speak in public even after 30 years at this why are why is almost every human being at least nervous but more likely scared to speak in public the human species does not have many universal fears that cross geographies and genders and time and space and cultures and everything else. There are only a few, but public speaking is one of them. And it's intriguing to me why that is, why such a deep seated fear exists in us for an activity that is not life threatening. <laughs> we're, we're afraid of death, that's life threatening, but public speaking is not. So I wanna explain where that comes from because understanding what, why it is so deep in our DNA to be scared of this helps us to, to counteract that fear with behaviors that will make you better instantly. And by the way, I want to, when I say instantly, I mean it. I, uh, that's not hype. If you will do these behaviors, you will be better the very next time you speak in public. 
I've seen it happen hundreds of times. I was at a, comp a corporate conference this weekend from the company I work for, and my CEO, uh, we were talking, and I he asked me to coach him in public speaking a few years ago, and I gave him exactly the tips because he was making these mistakes, and he got better, and he he was happy about it. So this just just works. Okay, the common public speaking mistakes that I mentioned, and then some temp simple tips to improve instantly, right away, um, to get better, because we all need that reward. Okay, so what's the deal? Why are we so scared to stand up in front of other human beings and let words come out of our mouth? Why is this such a scary thing? Well, it goes way back, way, way back in human evolution, in our societal evolution, and just who we are and the way our brains developed. And it goes back to this time. So if I were to if I were to show you this photo and ask you, so what is, what is this depicting? What phase of human development are we seeing here? And if you said hunter-gatherer, then that's what I hoped you would say. I don't know if this is the best hunter-gatherer picture, but I like it because the guy's walking with a wolf, which I kind of, which I find funny. I guess we were domesticating dogs then also. But this is our hunter-gatherer phase. And if you put human evolution and human development on a timeline, this is our biggest phase. This is the majority of our experience as a species, as a group of beings on the planet. We were hunter-gatherers. There are still hunter-gatherers on Earth. It's our iPhones and our Netflix accounts and our electric cars and our overly anxious modern society are very, very recent developments in the long span of human development. This is who we are deep, deep down. And big, deep, deep parts of our brain are still in this phase. And we are still living on the savanna and we are still trying to survive against a world that wants to kill us. Because when we were in this phase of things, human beings were not nearly at the top of the food chain. We were not masters of our domain as we like to think we are now. We had very little control over what happened to us. And every single day was a life-threatening situation in this world. And if you look at human beings compared to other creatures on the planet, that wolf, for instance, or saber-toothed tigers that existed then, or any of the other creatures, we are relatively defenseless. Human beings were a pretty sad lot when it comes to that kind of thing. We don't have fangs. We don't have claws. We don't even have, we can't run particularly fast, and we don't have a, a, like a coat of fur. Like we don't, we don't have the things other animals have to protect themselves. So, the question is, how did we survive? How did we make it off the Serengeti plane? How did, we, how did we end up spreading across the world and becoming what we are today? The answer, the real answer is we almost didn't. If you start to research this a little bit, um, I've read estimates that, that humans got down to like a thousand individuals at one point. We almost didn't make it, but we did. Thank goodness we're here. How do we do it? We don't have the things other animals have. So if you think about this society, for the picture we're looking at and, and the world you were living in then, you had two advantages. Human beings have two advantages that were small advantages, but they have outsized results. And, and one of those is our overly large brain, specifically our prefrontal cortex, the front part of our brain, the most recently evolved part of our brain. Because that is where language lives. Language was a breakthrough. Thumbs were nice to have too, of course. But language, developing complex language systems was the, was the big thing for human beings. Our prefrontal cortex let us develop language. If we have language, now we can band together and we can communicate across space and we can make teams. So we had words, essentially, words and each other, our small groups and our language abilities are all we had to survive this world. And because we had language and we had each other, we could start to build tools. 
and then we could start division of labor and then we could build societies and then we could build iPhones. Okay, all of that is because we grew this front part of our brand that let us speak to each other in complex ways and then we could build teams and build coalitions and, and get off the Serengeti plane and then overcome our disadvantages that we have. We aren't super strong, we aren't super fast, our hearing and sight are not nearly as good as the average house cat, and but that's how we did it. Okay, so understanding that and understanding the crucial uh, role of words, of speaking, of speech, of communication inside small groups of human beings. It was it's it's a survival mechanism we developed, and because it's a survival mechanism, it's deep in our brain. It's really down deep. It's down in part of our brain that is completely irrational. It's in the limbic system, in the back of your brain, what they call your lizard brain. And so there are parts of our brain that are completely illogical and irrational uh, that control our emotions. So let me ask you this. In, this. in this scenario I just described and in this picture, in that world, where we spent so much time. What would happen if you alienated your group? What would happen if you said something that offended the group and they kicked you out of the group? What if you were expelled out of this little family or team or group and you were left on your own in this world I just described? What would happen? Well, this would happen. You would die. It was a death sentence. Being alone, being rejected from your peer group was a death sentence back then. And this is when those deep parts of our brains are still developing. So there are, there are fundamental, powerful, irrational parts of our brain that still think and feel that if I offend my peers, if I say something to my peers that makes them reject me, I will die. It's the, it's, the, it's the classic fight or flight reflex. If you learn that in psychology 101 or biology or whatever, wherever they teach that, it's that deep part of your brain that says, I'm about to die, therefore I must either fight my way out or flee, run from the situation to, to save my life. So that's why we're scared of public speaking because that part of our brain still thinks if I'm rejected by any group of human beings, I will die. And so all the mechanisms in our body that have developed to help us survive life-threatening situations take over in the simplest public speaking environment, which makes no sense at all, logically, but that's not the part of your brain we're dealing with. That is why public speaking is scary. Rock. Don't let it get you. Okay, understanding that, knowing why, we're all scared. Every human, if they tell you, I'm not scared of that, they're, they're not telling you the truth. You can get better and become less nervous, but I have been doing this forever. I taught it for a decade and I still get nervous every single time, every time. I've just built coping mechanisms um, that I'm gonna teach you to get better. So let's jump into the pro tips to help overcome what happens in your body when you have that fight or flight reflex. First is to take a walk. I'll explain. Over-prepare, stand still, and the one that students used to fight me on, lose the notes. I'm gonna take your notes away. I'm taking away your three by five cards. I'm taking away your loose leaf handwritten notes. I'm taking them away, but you're gonna be okay. You're gonna be okay, stay with me, I promise. There is a better way. There is a better way. Okay, so first, take a walk. What do I mean by that? When I say you have a public speaking opportunity or responsibility, you're going to stand up in front of humans and have, have words come out of your mouth 
and you need to make an impression, what do you do? First thing is take a walk. This is a human body. Now, the early on on this, when we were talking about that fight or flight reflex that you have every time that I have, everybody has when we have to speak in public, and now you know why such a powerful reaction happens in your body. Okay, let's talk about that reaction a little bit. Physiologically, what happens in your body? The fight or flight reflex re releases adrenaline. It pumps it directly into your heart and it routes it to your extremities, to your hands and to your feet. Your hands so you can fight, your feet so you can flight. You can get the heck out of there, you can beat feet. Now, what this is, is a, a, an energy boost, a short-term energy boost, and the short-term is important. We've all seen stories of, you know, a car will fall on a mechanic and like a suburban housewife will lift the car up and get these super short burst of extra superhuman power comes from that reflex. The thing is, though, your body only has so much potential energy inside it at any one time. And so your body must reallocate the energy. It doesn't pull new energy from the sun. It reallocates the energy inside your body for a short period of time to fight, fight or flee, to get out of that situation. Well, if it moves it to your hands and your feet, that's why your hands shake, by the way. If you have, Your hands will shake in, if you get uh, into this mode. Where does it get the energy from? Where, where does it come from? If it takes it, it sends it to your hands and feet. Well, it pulls it from the most energy intensive part of your body, the one that's taking up the most energy in your body right now, and that's your brain. It turns off parts of your brain so it can have that energy to, to put into your hands and feet. It doesn't turn off your whole brain, it just turns off parts of your brain. You know what part it turns off? You're probably saying it out loud. It turns off your prefrontal cortex. It turns off the words <laughs> because in this situation, you don't need words. If a saber-toothed tiger is bearing down on you, words won't help. A, a reasoned argument why you should not eat me is useless. You need to run. So it turns off the words. You wanna know why when you stand up in front of people, you forget your name? You ever done a public speaking thing and you sit down and immediately you're like, ah, I should have said this. Oh, I forgot to say that. You ever been in a heated argument with someone and you walk away and five minutes later, you think of the best burn in the world. You're like, oh, I should have done that one on them. You are experiencing this effect. Your body turns off the prefrontal cortex because it doesn't need words. But the moment that situation passes, you will feel your body change. You will be instantly tired because your body has, has done this energy surge and it has to, it has to let loose. You, you, you can't do it for a very long time. So you get tired immediately and the words start to turn back on. And that's why you always think of the, the greatest thing you wanted to say after the highly charged moment. So what do you do? You take a walk. If, so here's the thing. If you have a public speaking opportunity, I recommend you get there an hour early to the physical location where you will be doing this talk. If you can't do an hour, try and do a half hour, at least 30 minutes. You need this time. I want you to go to the space where you're going to stand and speak, if possible. I want you to stand in the spot where you are going to speak, if possible. And I want you to have a little panic attack. I want you to imagine speaking in front of people. I want you to let that fight or flight. I want that to let it happen. I want the adrenaline to hit your body. I want your hands to shake. I want you to get dry mouth. I want that to happen before the moment you're speaking. And give yourself at least 30 minutes. An hour is better. For 10 years, I taught, uh, uh, I taught and for 10 years, I showed up an hour early and walked around the block before class every single time. The reason is, Remember I said this is a short-term phenomenon? Your body can't keep the fight or flight reflex going forever. It's a short-term thing, but the good news is you can use that short-termness in your favor. 
because you can let that adrenaline hit and then go take a walk. And what that does is get your blood flowing and it moves the adrenaline out of your system faster. It lets the words turn on sooner. And then also when you go to do your public speech, your talk, you literally cannot have that reaction at the same level two times in the same time period. You, your body can't do it because it used up that energy supply. That's why the hour matters, the 30 minutes to an hour. Because if you give yourself six hours, your body will, you'll eat a granola bar and all of a sudden your body can have a fight or flight reflex again. So you need to have that little window where you let it hit you, then go take a walk and move the adrenaline out of your system, then go back in the room. I'm not saying you won't be nervous, you will be nervous. But understand, you physically can't be as nervous as you were the first time. You can't. That's a good thing. So now you can control it. So go out there and take a walk and you're going to look like these people. You're going to look like these stock images of people walking in a field. You're going to be so happy and relaxed. You're going to be smiling. Like, you know what? I'm about to crush this public speaking thing. I kid. You're going to be nervous. There's nothing wrong with that. But you will not be as totally bound up with nerves and anxiety as you would have been if the first time you walked into that room was two minutes before you had to speak to everybody. It's crucial. Take a walk. Walk around the building. If the weather's nice, walk outside. Walk in place. Do something to move your body and get that adrenaline out. Okay, that's take a walk. That's tip number one. Tip number two is to over-prepare. Now, when I mentioned lose the notes earlier on, and I said, you're not going to get to have your notes if I'm your public speaking teacher. You don't get to carry your three by five cards up. Those go out the window. They don't. Think about this, by the way, just for, uh, as an aside. Have you ever been in a public speaking event where someone used three by five cards and you were impressed by their public speaking? Ever? Did it blow you away when they were staring at the three by five? It doesn't, doesn't go like that. But the way to, uh, to set us up for success when we lose our notes is to over-prepare your topic. The number one fear, the heart, the deep, deep, deep down part of you, if I were to poll the room, if I were to ask you, what is really on your mind? What are you really, really afraid of? The word that we're going to come to is going to be competence. You're going to say things like, well, I'm going to look stupid in front of other people. I'm going to look like I don't know what I'm talking about. I'm going to forget what I'm supposed to say, and I'm going to look incompetent. Remember, that's that's the deep fear. If I look incompetent to my peers, I will be in value, I will be not valuable to my peers. I will be rejected. I will die, et cetera, et cetera. It's a competence thing. Okay. Well, here's an exercise I used to do with my students. And I do this when I when I teach public speaking. So you're afraid you're going to look incompetent in front of your peers. Fair enough. That's a that's a very valid fear. It's totally true. Well, let's I, I usually will ask people to raise their hand. I go, okay, how many pet owners? do I have in the room with me? People raise their hand. I say, if you don't have pets, do you have children? They raise their hands. If you don't have pets or children, um, do you have a favorite vacation spot or a restaurant or a favorite book or an author or a movie or whatever it is? Think of something that you love dearly. Think of your cat, cat people. If I were to ask you if we were live in the room, and I were to ask you with no notes of any kind, without any prep of any kind, if I were to ask you to stand up and tell us about your cat, could you do it? Would you be nervous? Sure. Would your heart be beating? Yes. Would you have dry mouth? Of course. But could you tell us about Patches, your cat? Mr. Fluffy Fluff? Of course you could. Of course you could. Parents. Could you tell us about your kids, about their baseball team, about their dance troupe, about the trip they just had last weekend where they went down and played soccer? Or what? Could you do that to a room of complete strangers with no preparation of any kind? Answer, of course you could. Of course you could. So it's the problem is not that you cannot speak in public because you, you can speak in public about what? About things you really know well. So the rule is, whatever your topic is, you must prepare so you know it as well as you know your pet or your child or your favorite vacation spot or your author or Marvel movies or whatever your thing is. 
You must know it so deeply you can't screw it up because it's part of who you are. When I was in, I was a band geek in high school and our band teacher, he used to, he used to say, you don't practice the song until you don't screw it up one time. That's not learning the song. You practice the song so you can play it without music so that even if you're outside and your stand falls over and an airplane goes over and a, and, and a bomb goes off behind you, you can keep playing that music because you know it so well. So the problem is not that you can't speak in public. The problem is competence. The best way to get confident is to get more competent. That's doable, right? That's achievable. You can learn, you can practice, you can go over your topic a million times. Now, I wanna say one caveat, do not have a script. Don't memorize a script. I'll talk more about that in a minute. That's a disaster, it's a booby trap. You will mess up, it will ruin you. Don't do a script. But you do, do, you do plan your topic, you plan your bullets you're going to do, and you just study those so much, practice it so much, you know it like your cat. Competence equals confidence. Trademark, Kevin Elliott, 2024. Okay, so that's overly preparing. It will set you up for success. Stand still. Okay, now I'm a public speaking teacher and this is I'm a public speaking nerd. I love watching public speaking. I do on YouTube, I watch lectures and I'm I'm just that nerdy for this stuff. And I'm about to take you into a little behind the scenes with public speaking teachers. I'm gonna give you some controversial information right here. I'm about to give you something that a lot of public speaking teachers really don't agree with. I'm gonna give you my hot take, as the kids say, on how to present yourself in a room. And I will defend this because I was at a, a, a mentioned I was at a company conference this last weekend and they hired a keynote to come in and he wandered all over the room. It drove me out of my mind. You might have been taught this way. If you took, I mean, there's some very large organizations like Toastmasters, which is a phenomenal organization, but they teach you to wander back and forth across the stage. You've all seen this where, where somebody will wander back and forth across the stage or they'll come down into the audience and they'll wander around between the tables and they'll just, as they're talking, they're wandering around and they're moving all around the room. I'm here to tell you that is a terrible idea. It doesn't do what you think it's doing. And people will say to me, oh, but Kevin, it helps people pay better attention to me. And I will say, it will make them pay attention to you, but it does it for exactly the wrong reason. If you've been in a, a situation, and we all have at this point, I'm sure, you've been in a situation where there's a person speaking in public, they're up in front of you and they start wandering around the room. You might've had a professor in school do this. You're sitting at your desk or your table or whatever and the person's starting to walk right toward you and they're looking at you and they're talking. Now, let me ask you, what do you feel? What do you think as that person is approaching you? Are you thinking, wow, what a compelling topic hey, I should take notes on that last bullet. I want to remember it later. Oh boy, this is really enriching me and I'm learning a lot. Are you thinking of those things? No, you're not. You're thinking, is he going to call on me? Is he going to come to my, is he going to touch me? Are they going to, like, what's good? You're thinking fight or flight. Your heart starts to beat, you're worried. You're, you're thinking everything except what the goal is. And the goal is to absorb the content being presented not stare at the presenter. It's a vanity thing. It makes people look at you. Okay, great. That doesn't mean they're paying attention to you for the right reasons. Your job as a, my, my best public speaking teacher I ever had said, your job as the, as the leader of that room, and that's what you are, is to maximize the message and minimize the messenger. They should not be afraid of the public, of the, the speaker. You should blend into the background. You should become part of the furniture of that room so people can relax and they can pay attention to what you're saying. So let me tell you how to do that. This is a diagram on the screen here of, of literally how you should set up the room. I want you to walk into every room you have to do a public speaking and I want you to arrange the room like this. It's easier than ever before. And you go, yeah, but they have a lectern there and they have this and they're like, move it. 
when you are the one being invited to speak in a room, you have every right to rearrange the room the way you need. And very rarely nowadays, almost never, it's impossible to, to rearrange this, this the, way that, the, the way you need to set it up. Okay, here's how it goes. There's your visual aid. So that can be a, it can be a flip chart. It can be a PowerPoint slide. It can be whatever. And, and increasingly rooms have screens and projectors and all that, a TV, something. A whiteboard, if it's a whiteboard, fine. Write your bullets up on a whiteboard. That's them. There's your audience. That's the people you're speaking with. And there's you over there. Oop, back up. There's you. See that little triangle we made there? Isn't that cool? Made a little triangle. That triangle is everything. It's so important. Because you can stand off to the side of your audience and notice, remember, this is all about your audience, not you. Your audience can look easily up one side of that triangle to you, and they can look up the other side of the triangle at your visual aid, and they can do it without moving their head. They also know when you stand there, and after a couple of minutes, they realize you're not going to move, you're not going to come at them, you're not going to scare them, you're not going to wander around the room. Watch what happens physically, they will relax. They will sit back in their chairs. They will start to take notes. They will look at, they will now know he's not coming for me. That's what you want to see. The other thing is you wandering back and forth, even if you don't come at them, you wander back and forth. You're walking in front of your visual aid. You're doing ping pong. You're, you're making your audience have to work for it. And you should never make your audience work for it. You should be able to hand feed them the information you want. You're there to serve them, not the other way around. And I'm going to explain in another section why this triangle configuration is important for you, the presenter, as well. So arrange the room this way. Also get rid of that little lectern, that thing you like to hang on to for dear life. You don't need it because you don't need notes, right? You're not going to need notes. Why is another reason it's important not to wander back and forth, not to move? Now, by the way, I don't mean stand stock still. I mean stand in a little circle, a little imaginary circle and you can shift your weight from foot to foot or whatever, but stand in a spot. And if you've ever seen me in public, do public speaking in person, you'll, you'll think back. Think back to every time you've seen it. It's always like that. Okay, so what's the big deal about the wandering back and forth? And people say, well, I've been taught and it, and it kind of helps with this. Here's, here's a fundamental reason. One is you got this guy coming at you, right? And everybody's, you're, you're already nervous just looking at a picture of me walking towards you making eye contact. Remember, eye contact is a predatory response. It's, it takes us back to our hunter-gatherer days. If you, it's like somebody staring at you in a, in a food court somewhere. It makes you feel creepy, right? We don't like that. So don't do that. But the other reason is this. Because if I come at you and then I turn around and I go to the other side of the stage, now your audience is looking at the back of your head and your bad haircut that I have there. I need a haircut in that picture. And if you've ever taken theater, if you've ever done performance, you know turning your back on the audience is not a good thing. It Because eye contact, while you don't want to stare at people, like hardcore stare at them, you, do, you want to do what they call scanning, which is your eyes should bounce from person to person across the room every few seconds. You just kind of scan the room. It keeps people engaged with you. You can stand in one spot, and you can use your head and your eyeballs, and you can control that whole room with your eyeballs. The moment you turn your back on your audience, they can't see your eyes, they disengage, they check their watch, they look at Facebook, they, you've lost them. So stand in that configuration and do it with your eyes. The other reason you need to get rid of your notes is so you can use your eyeballs. You're not staring at your notes. And if you don't trust me on this, if you're like, Kevin, okay, great, that's how you do it. But look, you're, are you telling me Toastmasters is wrong? No. Well, I am, yes. But I'm also telling you, have you ever heard of a TED Talk? We've all heard of TED Talks, right? This is what a TED Talk looks like. This is how they set it up every single time. TED is the most uh, popular and most seen public speaking forum on the planet. And look how they set their people up. You ever seen a TED talk? Go back and watch the videos. They literally give them a big red dot to stand on <laughs> and say, don't move off the dot, stay in the dot. And if they had, they, they, sometimes they don't even have a visual aid, but if they do, notice how they have the one at the bottom configured. Right? I don't come up with this stuff. I just steal it from the best in the world. So that's standing still and, and the importance of it. Okay, here we go. Lose the notes.
some of you may still be crossing your arms at me and going, nope, not going to do it. I want my three by five cards. It's not going to happen. I want my notes because I need that life raft. Hang with me. I've already mentioned why having notes is a bad idea. It breaks eye contact. Um, and when I say notes, I mean a script also. So if you're, if you're thinking, aha, I'll just memorize a script. Bad idea. It's the worst idea, actually. Because here's what will happen. Is you'll memorize your script, and then you'll stand up there, and you will start to deliver your script. It will not seem natural, even if in your mind you think it will. It will not. Um, the other thing is, if what happens if somebody raises their hand and asks a question? How are you going to? What, what are you going to do? You have a script, and the whole goal of your talk is to be engaging and to take questions and to be live in the moment as an expert on your topic. And if you who can't take a question because you have a script, see, you've cut your audience off already. But remember, you're gonna over-prepare. You are gonna know your topic so well, you can talk about it like you talk about your cat. And if you do that, you don't need notes in front of you. But here, but, but, but wait, there's more. I'm not leaving you totally out to dry. I'm not making you have to memorize every single thing. You are going to have a life raft. You are going to have a prompt. You are going to have a help. And it's going to be better than any notes you could ever take. So look at this. Remember this figure from earlier in my presentation? Remember the, uh, the human figure? Now, if I were to ask you, what was I talking about? when I showed you this picture last? What was the topic? What was I, what, what did I use this visual to describe? And you might say, I hope you say, oh, the fight or flight reflex, remember? Because the arrows and the adrenaline went to your hands and feet, and so you it took away the words, and you'll, and you'll describe to me what I was talking about when you see that photo. Now, isn't that interesting? Just a few minutes ago, I, I gave this, and without any prompting at all, all I had to do was show you this little picture. And you can probably recite a whole chunk of this presentation that I just did. So when I say lose the notes, what I really mean is lose those hand, those, those notes you're holding in front of you that break eye contact and break the moment. Because I've had notes this entire presentation. I had it the whole time. There's my note. I have visual cues that I build into my visual aid. See, the visual aid is not there just to help your audience. It's there to help you, the presenter. It's your, it is your notes, and I've been doing it all through this presentation. I've had notes right there in front of both of us, but you didn't know that because you, the audience, saw the pictures and you thought those pictures were just for you. They're also for me. Now, I know this topic really well. I've given this particular presentation, I don't know how many dozens of times, and I've taught public speaking for 10 years, all the things I've read in my resume to you. That goes back to knowing this topic so well, but I still want those visual aids because it helps you and it helps me. And the pro tip is you can hide your notes inside these visuals and they will prompt you. See what they do? They strike the right balance. They prompt you so you know what you're gonna be talking about but they also don't let you have handwritten like word for word notes. So you must speak more in the moment. We call it extemporaneous speaking. What that means is well prepared, but in the moment. So I use these as prompts. And so every time I give this presentation, I say things a little bit differently because I can speak in the moment and I can give most recent examples like, oh, I was at a corporate conference last, like yesterday, two days ago and I was with my CEO and he told me that my the, the tips he did here really helped him. Okay, I can amend and update and tweak on my presentation in the moment because I don't have it strictly written down. I have prompts that gives you the flexibility you need to answer questions, to be in the moment, to notice things happening in front of you and to adjust. It's magic and nobody knows you're doing it. They'll say things to you like, oh, you just said that right off the cuff or like off the top of your head. Are you, were you just winging that? That's my favorite one. Were you just winging that? It's like, no, I've only been working on it 10 years. That's how you do it. That's how you look natural. And if you think back to the best public speaking you've ever seen, it was like this, wasn't it? It was like this. It was extemporaneous. So the, the beautiful thing is 
you position yourself this way, and now your audience can take you in and your visual aid without moving your head, and so can you. Now you can use that super powerful tool of eye contact in the right way because you can glance back at your visual aid and see where you are at any given time. You can also then look at your audience and they see you now we're not playing ping pong and everybody's relaxed. You're going to be standing still so they know you're not coming for them. Now they relax and they pay attention. You relax because you know you have a safety net and everybody has a better time. And this is how I, there's a flip chart. This is how I do it every single time. Now, some of you are thinking out there, Kevin, this all sounds great. And congratulations on you being able to do these techniques and et cetera, et cetera. But what if I stand up in front of people and I forget something? What if I forget something, Kevin? I'm deathly afraid of forgetting something. And the answer is, I know, and me too. And it's totally natural. And there's nothing wrong with that fear at all. Two things I want to tell you on this. One is you will forget something. If you go to this extemporaneous style speaking, and you should, you will forget something every single time you present. You will. I do. Every single time. Here's the thing, though. Would you rather have someone stand up and read a manuscript of a talk to you so they don't forget something? Or, as an audience member, would you rather have someone who knows their topic, who can speak to you like a human being, in the moment, answer questions, and they forgot a little something that you will never know about? So that's one. You will forget something. That's okay. No problem. But here's the other thing. You can overcome that in the moment. We've all, you're like, what if I melt down? What if I have a panic attack? What if I have to... Okay, I totally get it. I've, I've had students do this, and here's exactly what you do. I mean, literally do these things I'm about to show you. Okay, if you if you stand up there and you just forget something and you feel the fear and you're starting to panic and you 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 want to run off stage crying, okay. Here's what you do. No kidding. Do these things. Pause. I want you to stop. Okay, just stop. Next thing is stop speaking. Just say, okay, I'm, I'm in this moment. I forgot what I'm supposed to say and do. Stop and say to your crowd, say, just a moment, please. Okay? They will give you that grace. It's a it's a misconception that your audience wants to watch you fail. Some people think that. They go, oh, they just want to watch me fail. No, they don't. No, they don't. Do you? When you go to when you go to a public speaking thing, do you want to see them bomb? No, you don't, because humans have empathy to each other. We also developed empathy on the Serengeti plane. We feel for each other. We want to see each other succeed. And if you are in a room and you do want people to succeed, if that makes you happy, well, you're a sociopath. I'm sorry. I don't know what to say about that. But most human beings don't. And they are pulling for you. And they know how scary it is to stand up there. And just by you standing up in front of the room and doing this, they're already impressed with you. They're already impressed that you had the courage to do this in the first place. So they'll give you the benefit of the doubt. You pause. You say, just a moment. Next, I want you to take a deep breath. This is important because it's going to inject oxygen into your body. That oxygen is going to go to your brain because your brain is starving because you're starting to you're starting to breathe really shallow, right? So you take a deep breath, it will let oxygen to your brain and the words will turn back on. Because your brain will get that oxygen boost, you'll take a moment, okay? I also want you to look at your slide. So when you stand there, say, just a moment, take a deep breath, and I want you to look at your slide. And on your slide, if you do it the way I just described, you're going to have an image of some kind that's going to remind you what you're supposed to be talking about. And after that moment, the words, you'll go, oh, okay, yeah, yeah, yeah. And you'll pick back up, and you will finish that presentation. I guarantee it. And the reason I can guarantee it is because I've seen students go through this phenomenon, what I just described, so many times. And they want to sit down and go, I screwed up. They go, no, 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 you stand right there. Take a deep breath. Look at your slide. Take a moment. And every single time they go, oh, okay, okay. All right. And then they get back on course and they never do it twice. I've never seen this happen twice in the same talk. Never. 
So if you can get through this, you're going to be okay. Do those behaviors. Here's what you do not do. Apologize. I'm so sorry. Oh my gosh. I practiced this so hard in the last night. I was in front of the mirror. I've been working on this for, I was in my hotel room. I, I'm so sorry, everybody. I didn't know. That's not, that makes you feel a little bit better, but it makes your audience feel awkward for you because they, right, they, they want you to, it doesn't help in the room. Don't apologize and do not tell us what you forgot. Oh, I meant to say that. Don't tell us. We don't know. We don't know what was inside your brain. We don't know what's on. We don't, we have no idea. And if you don't tell us, we don't know what you forgot. And so we just see what you presented and go, that was great. You go back to your hotel room and you're like, ah, oh, shoot, I should have. Oh my God. Fine. I do that every single time. You can do that, but don't tell us about it. If you take that moment, you work through it. You don't apologize. You will get back on track. You will finish your talk and you will be better next time you go out to speak. If you do these things, you will be better instantly the next time you stand up in front of people. I promise. Here's our pro tips. Take a walk, over prepare, stand still in the room and lose your notes and you will be better instantly. There's my contact information. I'll leave it up on the thing and I'm gonna turn this back over to Jamie to see we have a few minutes if there are any questions from the crowd. So I'm gonna stop sharing now. Perfect, thank you, Kevin. And we do actually have quite a few questions for you. Cool. Um, so we'll see how many of these we can get through. Um, the very first one is, I have read studies that writing and journaling about test anxiety helps reduce it and helps students succeed. Are you aware if there's a similar activity that helps with public speaking anxiety? I don't know a study, but that makes intuitive sense to me. It's part of the reason I mentioned going to the room ahead of time. And so there are plenty of studies on visualization. Athletes know this. Um, if you can go in and, and visualize, and I think that journaling is the same thing as you're getting your words out and you're, you're sort of practicing how you're going to feel when you are experiencing that thing in the future. It's, it's rehearsal. And so I absolutely do believe that. That's why I, I, I recommend you practice at home, but you also, if you can, get into the room where you're actually going to speak and you'll do, you'll do better. Your, your, the deep part of your brain will already have been there and then you can, you will do better. Agreed. Uh, there is a question about the recording. This presentation was recorded. It will be available on our website, ruralsafetycenter.org under the training dropdown. Um, on our webinar archive page within a few days. So that will be available. Um, the next question for you, Kevin, is I work for a municipality that still does town meetings. They set the room up with rows on each side of the microphone in the center. The moderator wants each person speaking when it's their turn to face forward to the board of selectmen to ask and answer their questions. It leaves at least a few hundred or so people staring at the back of your head. Any input on how to handle that type of situation would be great. Of course. So the, the, in that, because I've done this too, I've spoken at commission meetings in my town just from local town things, and that's how it's set up, exactly like that. So I here's what I do, because <laughs> I the commission is your audience when you're doing your presentation, okay? So the people are sitting behind you, but for that moment, you have to, that the people sitting in front of you up on the dais, the commissioner, whoever you're talking to, are your audience. However, what I do is when um, they open the floor for questions, if they, once the commission has any, they, they answer any questions, I will turn myself around and look at the audience, and turn my back to the to the commission. I just be, because now they now they're the audience if they have questions. So in that situation, which is a which is a very common but pretty highly specialized situation, just think of your audience as the commission for that and then take questions of the whole room around there and they're not going to fire you if you do another question for you is do these pro tips that you talked about also work when taking job interviews yeah these are so these the reason i like these is these are universally valuable anytime you can com you communicate human being to human being these will work if you go into a job interview and you're so well prepared and you've studied the company, you've studied all, all the stuff and you don't have any notes and you're just sitting there talking off the cuff, you are much more likely to get that job. 
Yes, these work every every time. Go to that job interview and walk around the block for 30 minutes before you walk into that interview. 100% and you'll do better. Do you have any tips for quelling angry hecklers or interrupters, uh, particularly in a public input session? <laughs> I do. I don't have time to give them right now. Um, Jamie, maybe we do a part three on this because I literally, I have a presentation called uh, Mental Jiu-Jitsu snipers and filibusters because there are types of people in these meetings and i can i can teach you about these people so yes is the answer but i don't have time right now and so maybe we'll do another version you know that, that presentation and um hopefully you come to that one all right you heard it here first we're gonna get a part yeah. three um, yeah, yeah. there are ways to do it by the way you, you can absolutely neutralize and manage that room 100 percent Perfect. Um, so the next question we have for you is, do you have any guidance on training your senior leadership to speak, speak in public that don't have a PowerPoint? Uh, so they won't use a visual aid? Is I guess is the idea. They won't use a PowerPoint yeah. or, or, or whatever. Um, the, so they're, they're the boss. They're going to do what they say. But th you have a video of this presentation now. I recommend you send it to them and say, hey, this, if, you, if you think my logic is sound, send it to them. Um, if not, the 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 biggest thing is not, let me put it this way, the biggest thing is that that person over prepares. So if you're coaching that person, they need to be so well prepared, they can go ahead and do this without a visual aid. And then if they remove the visual aid, it's not, it's, I understand, fair enough, it's, you're actually handicapping yourself a little bit and your audience will be a little less involved because visuals are important. But the most important thing is they over prepare. So they don't then they don't have a visual, they have no visual aid, and then they also don't have then they stand up there, look at their cards, or they're looking at some handwritten notes. That's the worst case scenario. So if they just won't use a visual aid, well then make sure they really, really, really over prepare. And I'm gonna do one more question and then we're gonna wrap up because we're right at two. So is the layout of the audience ideally in a single long straight row as you showed in your graphic or is that for simplicity of the illustration? Yeah, that's simplicity. I mean, the the classroom style and in, in, in strict grid rows is fine. If you can have a little like amphitheater style, the U-shaped style, whatever. The main thing is so everybody can see you and they can see your visual aid without having to move their head back and forth. They can just easily take in the whole room, configure your room that way. Perfect. And with that, unfortunately, we've come to the end of our time for today. Thank you to everyone who put in a ton of questions. Um, thank you so much to Kevin for the fantastic information. And as you just heard, we will be doing a part three. So we'll get that scheduled and we'll get that information out to you. So thank you so much, Kevin. We appreciate your time today. Sure thing. Thank you, everybody.